You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, Episode 52. This week on the show, we're talking new products. We look forward to the 2016 waterfowl season and some of the new products that are on the market that we're looking forward to checking out this year. All right, welcome to this, the 52nd episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We are your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting. Uh, I'm your host, Josh Palm. Joining me today, as he does all the time, is Mindy Van Dan. Dan Harushka, how are you, buddy? Doing pretty well. How about yourself? Oh, I'm good, man. You know, I'm uh, glad to get back in and doing some recording with you. We're just, uh, you know, we're both in just super busy with stuff going on right now. And, uh, you know, it always feels good to get back and talk some waterfowl uh, hunting and stuff. And we've been, uh, you know, talking about some future episodes and topics and getting some stuff lined up. So it feels kind of good to get back into that swing of things. And, uh, you know, I was just telling you before we started recording here that my, my son's T-ball season just finished up. So feeling pretty good about my first coaching effort, uh, there. <laughs> and, um, yeah, you know, firmly in the, uh, the waterfowl withdraw dog days of summer for me and just kind of counting the down days down till uh, September when I'll go goose hunting and you'll go elk hunting. Um, well, yes, but did, back to <laughs> back to the t-ball. Did you get ejected at all? No, no. I'm uh, you know, I'm I'm all about just leadership and uh, good sportsmanship. Well, there you go, and all that kind of stuff. And um, you know, I mean, it's kind of hard to get upset about anything going on in the game when my kids are really more interested in just digging in the dirt and rolling around on the ground than than anything else. Mm. So. You know, good times. Yeah, they're learning. That's fun. That's good stuff. Yeah, I think everybody had a good time, and it, you know, if anyone out there has ever coached little kids in sports and t-ball specifically, uh, you know, it can be a challenge. So, but we had a good good group of kids, and it was it was fun. So, um, just had our last game tonight. So, you know, we're kind of getting a little bit late late start on our recording this evening, but you know, we do got a good show lined up here uh, this week. We got. Uh, some waterfowl news that we're going to cover. We've got the uh, Ask HB uh, question of the week. Uh, we've got a great uh, retriever training quick tip from uh, Barton Ramsey, Southern Oak Kennels. And then for our main topic, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, some of the new products that we're looking forward to uh, checking out and using in the uh, 2016, you know, 2017 waterfowl season. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of good things coming to the market. And I think that's one thing that we've talked a little bit about on the show in the past. But, um, you know, innovation uh is fueled by competition and you know you're seeing so many different companies um uh, you know trying to gain their footing and and get their piece of the the waterfowl industry market and um you know that has led to some really cool stuff coming out and you know some new companies doing some cool things and some old companies that are you know trying to reinvent and uh reestablish themselves so we'll talk about some of that stuff which is which is fun and uh, pretty cool but you know, wanted to just kind of cover our bases here in the beginning. If uh, if you're new to the show, welcome. Um, if you're, you know, a veteran of the show and you've been around for a while, uh, uh, we appreciate you sticking with us. If you guys want to check anything out that uh, we have going on, you can check out hpoutdoors.com. If you want to hit us up and communicate with us, you can shoot us an email at info at hpoutdoors.com. Um, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, all the social media stuff. You can catch up on all the past episodes um, on iTunes. If you subscribe through iTunes uh, or Stitcher, one of those types of services, you know, this, the uh, episodes get automatically pushed out to you uh, whenever we release them. So it makes life easy for you guys. And, uh, you know, we certainly appreciate the support. Um, before we get too far into this, Dan, I did want to make a point here for our uh, our listening audience. That's sort of a new a new thing for us. Um, as many of you know, we've uh, we've had a partnership with Higdon Outdoors for quite some time, um, dating back to when HP Outdoors was just stood up and before the podcast was even uh, 
even going on. And um, recently they've started doing a giveaway. And what, what that giveaway is, is basically uh, they've given us a, a, a code. And when um, you access their website through that code and purchase, you know, Higdon products, you automatically get entered into a drawing uh, to go on a hunt with the Higdon Outdoors crew um, in their, that their spots in Kentucky, um, you know, one day, I think it's like next season or something like that. So um, we've linked up that code through all of the Higdon uh, Outdoors or Higdon Decoy logos on the HP Outdoors website. So if you're interested in Higdon products, Go to the uh, HP Outdoors website, click on their logo that we have uh, in a couple different spots on in our website, which will take you to their site. But anytime, if you make a purchase, that'll automatically get you entered into the drawing because you've purchased it through our, our affiliate link. And, um, you know, that's something that they can track so they can see how many guys, you know, are coming to their site through us. So it obviously helps us out too. And, you know, we're not just, uh, you know, fans of the Higdon products because they you know the you know we've had a relationship for a while we we're fans because we, you know we like their products so I, I honestly think that and and the actual truth of it is before we ever had any kind of relationship with higdon i was using higdon decoys because i think the quality and the price point that they offer their products at is unmatched in the market um so definitely give them a look if you're in a position where you're looking to buy some decoys yeah and going back to that hunt um i think all you have to pay for is your license and uh travel to get there i think everything else is paid for so um i know those guys they really enjoy their donuts and the rest of the food down there at the at the office and i'm sure you know you got uh shanahan in there working for him now you got kelly powers so i mean you could be sharing a duck blind with two world championship callers so um that would be a, a really, really good time. Plus the rest of the guys that work down there are, are awesome as well. So yeah, if you're going to, if you're going to purchase some decoys, definitely if it is from Higdon, look into that link and, and get entered. Yep. And if you got any questions on it, shoot us an email or hit us up on social media. You can do that. One of the easiest ways to do it is uh, join up with our Facebook listeners group. If you search uh, HP outdoors, waterfowl podcast listeners group on Facebook, uh, it'll come up and just request access and we'll, we'll put you in. And uh, a lot of guys in there talking good stuff. And, uh, you know, we were talking just before we started recording here tonight, talking, um, you know, with a guy about, uh, you know, slotted bags versus mesh bags and stuff like that for some decoys that he just got. So um, if you want to talk shop, come over there and uh, join us and we'll do I that. I think we got, so, uh, what, we're up to like 300 in there now. Yeah, I think there's about 300 guys so, in there, give or take. So And, uh, and ladies. Pretty cool. There's a couple ladies in there. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I, I, I feel like I see the same guys posting <laughs> quite often, but um, I know we get some, some others that chime in um, occasionally as well. So I appreciate everybody being in there and, and welcome everyone else that is interested in joining in. Let's do it. So, um, all right, man, let's go ahead and roll in and get, get into some of the show today. And uh, we'll start it off with a little bit of uh, waterfowl news. All right, Dan. So, um, my first news story isn't isn't really a uh, a significant story, and but it's a fact that I saw that I was kind of taken at back back, at back by. Um, I read a blurb somewhere that it said one million birds die every year from running into commercial and residential windows. <laughs> and I mean, think about that: one billion. Birds. One billion um, or million? So million or billion? Billion, like like not Doctor Evil. Million, like billion with a B. Oh my That's what it said. Gosh. What? <laughs> and I mean, I'm thinking, okay, you know, not only if you're a duck coming down the flyway, is that you got to worry about hunters and all this other, this that and the other. You know, you got to make sure you're not flying into a pane of glass <laughs> or something like that. So. Pretty crazy, I thought, um, you know, when I saw that statistic. But uh, I'm assuming that is not just obviously waterfowl. That is, you know, Tweety birds and cardinals and all that other stuff, you know, flying into houses, which is probably more common. But, you know, I think everybody's probably been like, 
standing in the kitchen and all of a sudden you hear this thump and you're like, what was that? You know, and it was a bird (laughs) flopping off the window, you know, randomly. And apparently that happens maybe more than I could have even imagined happened. My dad has a couple, uh, picture windows in his house and the one is double paned. And there's been multiple times that, um, doves have flown in and, and broken the outside pane and didn't make it through the second one. But, um, I've probably seen that three or four times, and then he has a a bird watching room where you can't see in, but you can see out. And I don't know how many times I'm sitting over there having coffee with him, and bird <laughs> birds run into that and just get shaken up. I've never seen any die on that side, but they definitely they, <laughs> they just they just shake it <laughs> off. Huh? Well, they <laughs> they hit it and drop, and then you can see him get up and you know flutter off. He's he's brought a few inside while we're sitting there, but yeah, it's kind of I but a billion that's. It's a lot of birds. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of thought the same thing, so that's why I thought, well, let me let me mention that on the episode. Um, what do you got for us? Uh, my first one is uh, Beaver Tail Products acquires DOA Decoy Company. So, a company that has been, you know, leading manufacturer in aluminum waterfowl boats and mud motors, sneak boats, blind sleds, and all that are now in the decoy market. So. That's a uh, fairly recent, and you know it's they must see something there because they have a pretty pretty great market with what they do and a, a great product, so they're trying to branch out and they you know everything I'm reading here they believe it's a good move, obviously to acquire them and um you know it i don't I don't know how I feel about it. I feel like you know we talk about innovation and everything like that, and to cross markets like that. You know, that's just another company getting bigger, and I I feel like it dilutes their products a little bit because they don't focus on, you know, getting better. But we'll see. Time will tell. Well, I I, I kind of I can see both sides of the argument, but I'll play devil's advocate just because you brought up your side that you know that side. Um, the benefit that could happen here is let's say a company like DOA has some of the brightest minds in the business working and there's just great ideas there but maybe they just don't have the resources to lift that idea off the you know off the drawing board and get it into production you know to get acquired by a company that that might be able to put the resources into it that's required may fuel that innovation piece that we've talked about to a higher level now obviously the caveat here is you know you don't ever know who's going to be running the that part of the business and what they're going to do with it and you know that kind of thing but you know i guess trying to be optimistic that would be my hopes i mean you don't see a ton of uh uh, you know decoy companies cannibalizing each other you know we we've seen a lot of companies buying each other out lately you know zinc was purchased doa purchased um avery was purchased by banded you know so there's been some consolidation and that's probably more of a just a um you know a reality of the of the market in in the economy type of stuff but um you know the hopes would be that you know, maybe we can't do it, you know, do as much on our own, but when we pull our money together, maybe we can, uh, you know, do something that's even that's better. That's true. So. And, and Beaver Tail, you know, some of their sneak boats and whatnot are the hard plastic. So if they have the capability of, you know, the molding and the injection and everything like that, you know, they might be able to make some some uh, molds and, and get yeah, that they might, super they cheap. They might, might be able to, yeah, leverage some technologies that they didn't have uh, you know, on the decoy side and, and all that kind of stuff. So I guess time will tell. Um, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if this isn't the last we've heard of something like this. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of companies out there and a lot of decoy companies specifically. And I guess everyone is just trying to find, like I said, their piece in the market. And if that means teaming up with somebody else that can give you a little more push up that hill, you know, I wouldn't be shocked to, to see that happen a little bit more frequently, but, um, So my second story uh, for this episode is, you know, we were talking again and kind of joking before this episode, you know, before we started recording about me being a prepper now. And (laughs) I'm not a prepper as in like I'm digging a bunker in my backyard that, you know, might make my kids run out to and put hazmat suits on every day. But, um, you know, I I, I am prepping for um, a run on gun ammo as the election approaches this fall because they typically that typically happens around every election cycle and you know with some of the rhetoric coming out from uh you know 
Hillary Clinton, it, it, it's reason to believe that, uh, you know, this time it might be a little more worse than others because she's outright said that she's going to take on some of these things. So I've been purchasing, uh, you know, some firearms recently and, uh, you know, some ammo and things like that. And apparently I'm not the only one because uh, gun uh, sales have risen so much that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, was able to uh, get some revenue um, through these through some programs to give back to the states uh, for for conservation and, and things like that. So um, through the U.S. Uh, FWS, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they're giving back one point one billion dollars um, from taxes that have been collected on hunting, shooting, fishing, and sort of other outdoor equipment. Uh, the money is going to be allocated to the state and fish and wildlife agencies to, you know, hopefully do good with. Um, you know, we all know that some of the states aren't run as well as we'd hoped. But uh, nonetheless, they're going to have a little more money to work with. And uh, the, the funding is going to be broken up based on state hunting and fishing license sales. So, um, as you might expect, some of the prime suspects to uh, most greatly benefit from this, this program is... Uh, Texas is looking to receive approximately $50 million. Pennsylvania, uh, approximately $34 million. Uh, in California, uh, approximately $40 million. So, um, you know, one of those things where, you know, uh, we're getting a little bit back for putting money into what we enjoy doing. So, uh, you know, I think it's a good thing and hopefully the money will be able to be used uh, for a good cause and um, make some uh, make some headway in some projects that maybe wouldn't have been funded otherwise. I hope they get that swamp buster going back up here in Geneva. Right. That'd be awesome. And I don't know if, it's a good program. if you can hear it, but there's a train just rumbling my house right now. That might be the loudest. I did. <laughs> might be the loudest train yeah, I've ever I, heard in my life. Yeah, it was, it was quite loud. Okay. <laughs> Wow. All right. Well, that's that's awesome news, and you just keep rolling with the billions today. But um, going into the not billions but millions, talking about snow geese is my next uh, piece of news here. And really the wildlife management officials are now trying to curtail the growth of snow geese colonies, colonies on the north slope. Um, it's really getting out of hand, and, I mean, they're talking – Last year, they, they were counting about 12,000 nests, and in early 2000, there were only about 250. So you're talking 16 years, and it's, you know, the, the population is doubling every three years, and they're saying, you know, even with all the piles of snow geese that people put on the ground, it is not making a difference at all. Um, on top of that, there's people in Alaska that um, these biologists pretty much watch the bear's they say that uh, never at one time can they see more than a half mile, and in that half mile, they they usually see four or five bears just walking through from nest to nest, just lunch buffet, just straight eating every single egg. So even with something like that going on, um, these geese are just growing at an exponential rate. Um, they're saying, you know, maximum lifespan is 10 to 12 years, and you know they're not picky eaters, so they just keep keep living and reproducing, and it's really getting out of hand. So we'll see how that uh, how that comes about and what they're going to do to it. If they're going to go up and and really start crushing these nests, or or what's going to go on. But you know we know what kind of damage the snow geese can can do to an area, and you know really worried about erosion in Canada just because of the the root system's getting picked out by their by their beaks. So um, kind of crazy because I mean the amount of birds that are killed, it's just it's no match for for Mother Nature. And you know when things get out of hand, what can happen with disease and you know avian flu and everything like that. So this is a time where you know they can either up limits or really go and and try and take care of it before this gets out of hand. Yeah, I mean it seems like they're running out of options. So. You know, as the old saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures. So maybe they'll, uh, you know, think of something creative to to help uh, control, and hopefully that'll benefit, you know, um, you know, goose hunters and uh, you know, 
I don't really know. We don't, unfortunately, we don't really get this no goose population here that, that they're talking about. So, you know, I don't really hunt them. Um, I've never hunted them really. So it, it's kind of, it's one of those things where it's hard for me to sort of wrap my head around and sort of grasp as to how severe the problem is. Cause the closest I've come to them is seeing, you know, videos on habitat flats of like a bazillion birds flying everywhere. Yeah. And they're saying it's, um, it seems to be like it's, uh, it's going away from us. They're kind of moving towards Alaska, uh, greener pastures there. And, you know, cause Canada is just getting overrun by them. So, um, it's, that's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Hmm. Oh, definitely a problem that sounds like they're going to have to uh, address at one point or another. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that's uh, that's your waterfowl news uh, for this episode of the show. If you got any good news stories that you're aware of that you want us to, to cover, uh, forward them on to us. We'll be more than happy to uh, you know include them in our in our breakdown here on the show. So uh, appreciate anybody forwarding that. And uh, let's go on and move on to the next part of the uh, program which is the Ask HP question of the episode. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! All right, and this week's Ask HP Outdoors question of the week is brought to you by Higdon Outdoors Quality Service Innovation. That's Higdon Outdoors. As we uh, talked about, check out HigdonDecoys.com, uh, but make sure you do it through the HP Outdoors website so you get yourself entered into that uh, that free hunt giveaway. Um, all right, Dan, this week's or episode's question comes from clay meyer clay wants to know how we feel about lesser uh, and greater goose decoys uh, particularly when hunting in fields uh, do we like to use one or the other or do we mix them together and kind of where do we stand on that so why don't, i'll let you start all right yeah they you know he uh prefaced that question by saying that they hunt a lot of ducks and this is coming from ohio so my first thing to say is there are so many freaking geese in ohio start hunting them and I need to get over there more than, than what I have in the, in the, in my history. But, um, you know, when, when we're really talking about it, both of them kill geese, the graders and lessers, they're going to work. Uh, if you want to get super specific, you know, if you're running traffic, you want to, you want to go bigger, I would say, um, a bigger spread, a bigger, anything to get their attention. You know, if you want to put a bunch of silos out just to, to run that and, you know, get the attention of the, the passer buyers. But, um, if you're on the X or early season, I think lessers, you know, you could get away with that just fine. Um, you know, if you want to mix them, we mix them all year long and, and kill geese all year long. So, um, I wouldn't get too worried about it. I'd probably look for a deal and, and, you know, start your spread that way. Yeah, I, I don't think one way or the other it makes a big difference at all. Um, I've got lesser full bodies. I've got greater full bodies. Um, I, I use both, mix them together. It doesn't matter. Uh, I When I look at this, I look at which ones can I find cheaper, uh, which ones are easier for me to carry, which ones are easier for me to store, things like that. So oftentimes I prefer lessers because uh, I'm usually not, most of the time I'm not really running traffic. And if I am, I'm bringing silhouettes. I'm not doing, you know, a million full bodies. So I, I really don't like full bodies that much anyway, to begin with. So I, I tend to lean towards silhouettes anywho, but, uh, you know, for field hunting, it's nice to have some full bodies, especially around the blinds helps, helps hide you, you know, better in your pocket. Um, you know, those kinds of things, your graders are, are nice because they do give you that little bit bigger body. But, um, you know, I, I don't think you can go wrong either way, and I'm kind of with you. Look for the deal. If you're trying to trying to get the spread going, get what you can afford and, and get the best pricing on it. So um, if you've got a different stance on graders and lesser geese uh, when you're field hunting, let us know. We'd love to hear the uh, the you know the other points you might have, and um, you know we could learn something from you guys as well. Uh, Clay, for uh, sending in the question and us using it on the show, uh, shoot us your address and we'll send you out a free HP Outdoors uh, barrel decal. And that goes for anyone else. If you send us a question and we use it on the show, uh, you will also get a free decal uh, for your effort. So we certainly appreciate that. Um, all right, man. We've It's been a, a, a few episodes, or at least one. It could be more. I can't really remember. Uh, since we've had Barton on the show to share a, a tip with us and... Um, this week, I think he's got a really good one, and he makes some really good points. So, um, 
yeah, I want to play the, I want to play Barton's uh, piece and then, and then talk about it on the other side. So uh, let's get to it in this episode's uh, retriever training quick tip from Barton Ramsey, Southern Oak Kennels. Hey guys, this is Barton Ramsey from Southern Oak Kennels coming to you with your retriever training quick tip of the episode. And today I want to cover two specific issues. Probably sound a little bit repetitive uh, from some of the stuff I've said before, but I want to talk about two things that I see most commonly when people bring me their young dogs uh, either to train or just to show me their young dogs when they come back to the kennel or they've uh, purchase a dog from somewhere else and they want us to look at the dog. Um, a few things that we see commonly with these dogs. Um, first thing that we see is dogs that haven't been worked at all. And so people have missed out on very key months of training. I guess the thought might be that, uh, hey, you know what, I'm just going to let a professional do this, so I'm just going to let the dog be a dog. And so for the first I guess you take a dog home at, at two months of age. So from two months to six, seven, eight months, the dogs have not seen any type of structure. Uh, there's, there's been no type, uh, no, no obedience training, uh, very little retrieving, maybe just some fun retrieves, no introduction to things like water, uh, or birds, uh, even very little socialization. They think the dogs will socialize because the dog loves them. Uh, but the dog's not been taken anywhere except their house. And uh, this is very detrimental to gun dog training. When you bring a puppy home, uh, you should be doing some work. And we can get into what all that is uh, in another time, but there should definitely be things done with that dog. If not every day, uh, then every other day, you should be working with your dog. Uh, the best thing to do is just quick five-minute training sessions with puppies. Introduce them to everything. Take them everywhere. Make sure they have good experiences. Uh, but there needs to be something that's done with your dog. Uh, and the second thing I see is people who have done nothing but the fun stuff. And so what people will do is they'll start with retrieving, and they want to see how far and how fast the dog can go on to water retrieves and double retrieves and we get that question a lot. People ask, how long is training going to take? And you can tell people get in a big hurry and they want to do the fun stuff. I was reading a few articles on gun dog training last week. And in every article, um, multiple professional dog trainers were asked the question, what's the most common mistake that you see? And every single one, I think it was six different professionals said, people going too quickly, uh, too young with their gun dogs. And uh, I think I see this as much as anything. People want their dog to be doing the big dog stuff really quickly. So they start with how long and how far. And and they skip over so much basic obedience. And I tell people when they bring their dogs to us, don't expect to come back in a month and see your dog doing anything crazy. Because we're going to spend a lot of time building a foundation of obedience. We're going to do retrieves. Uh, we're going to do... Uh, we're going to work on memory retrieves. We're going to work on marks, even in the first month. But mostly what we're going to be doing is building foundational, basic obedience with sit, uh, remote sit, or stay, heal, and recall, or hear. And we're going to work those things until we feel like they are 100% solid before we move on. And then when we do move on, we're going to keep going back to obedience uh, and so I see a lot of dogs that they're really young and they're really impressive because they can do some really crazy, great things and they can run really far on retrieves and they mark really well. But then when they start running into issues, usually with handling on blinds, the dogs just fall apart because they don't have a basic foundation of obedience. Uh, so what I'd like to pass on to you guys is just those two things. Do something with your young dogs when you get a puppy. Uh, work with the dog, socialize the dog, and don't just do the fun stuff. Do the obedience stuff. Get treats in your pocket. Uh, get outside, teach your dog some basic obedience, and just drill those things. Keep it fun, keep it light, but do those things until they become uh, not just something your dog understands, but they become a habit. When you say here, the dog immediately responds and comes to you. When you say sit, the dog immediately puts his rear end on the ground. Uh, we hope this has been helpful for you guys. If you have any more questions about gun dog training, we'd love to talk uh, uh, with you about those, uh, either in the HP Outdoors podcast uh, Facebook page or uh, on our Facebook page in the Southern Oak Kennels Society, or you can contact us at www.southernoakkennels.com. Thanks. All right. As always, we certainly appreciate 
Barton's contributions to the show and definitely uh, encourage everyone to check out uh, Barton at Southern Note Kennels. They've got a lot of great stuff going on and, um, you know, world-class outfit that he's got working there. So definitely check those guys out. Um, you know what, Dan, he, he brought up some things about young dogs, you know, and some common mistakes that people make. And, you know, my, my golden retriever that I've talked about a lot on the show isn't a hunting dog, but we definitely made some of these mistakes, uh, with him as a puppy. And it, it has, it's impacted his ability to just learn simple things like obedience and, and all of that kind of stuff. So, Having looked back on it, you know, I, I kind of get where Barton's coming with some of these, even though I, I haven't really trained a dog, you know, personally to, to, to retrieve for waterfowl. Yeah, first, um, I do want to congratulate Barton on his adoption of a son. Uh, when we were talking about the episode and what he was going to cover, he was, <laughs> he's like, hey, man, yeah, you know, I'm sitting in Ukraine right now. And it's raining, so we're just stuck in a hotel. And I'm like, what are you doing in Ukraine? He said he's adopting his son. So um, they've been after it for a while. And I, they have a few kids of their own, but they, you know, felt the the pull from from the big man upstairs to go and adopt. So they ended up in Ukraine and um, just wanted to congratulate him on and his family on their new son, Liam, that just joined them recently. But going back to his point... Um, yeah, you know, starting with obedience, and it, I, I can't imagine a frustration he has when, you know, he's running all these dogs, and even if if he sells a dog and it comes back, or if someone buys a dog somewhere else and they want him to train it, and, you know, they want to do all the fun stuff, like you mentioned. They want to go and retrieve, and, and that's not going to happen if they can't listen to you, so... um he, it just has to be frustrating for him, I'm sure. But like he said, you know, start with obedience, and then you'll the fun stuff will come later. So make sure you get the groundwork, um, the the good foundation set, and then you know let the let the dog grow as it gets older, and and do all the double retrieves and the blind retrieves and and all that stuff. But starting with obedience, and I mean, easier said than done when you don't have a ton of time. But uh, you know, just great tips from him. So go with it yeah and it's just like anything else you know that's that, that's a skill whether you're working a duck call or a goose call or you're training your retriever there's no shortcuts you know there's just no way around it you if you can't do the fundamentals you'll never do the more advanced things so um, if your dog doesn't you know learn the basics and you know you put that time in in the beginning you know you'll kick yourself down the road when you're trying to do the more advanced yep. stuff like he said, and, uh, when you know. when you say sit and his butt doesn't hit the ground, you shouldn't be throwing bumpers for him to go and retrieve until he gets that down. So, you know, right. it's a like you said, it's a a dog is another another tool to utilize, and you want it working. So, you know, it it gets frustrating when your dog doesn't listen, and you know, I'm I'm guilty of it. Kimber doesn't always listen to me, and. You know, I want to take my frustration out on her, but really it's my own fault. And, you know, you learn from it, but there you go. Well, it was good to have Barton on the show again, and we look forward to having him, uh, you know, in episodes that come. So great stuff from him as always. But let's go ahead and uh, transition now into the uh, main portion of the show. And let's talk a little bit about products that we're looking forward to uh, seeing and using in 2016. All right, man. So this was a uh, you know a topic that was kind of kind of hard, kind of easy, kind of I'm not really sure how to feel about it because you know I look at all the magazines. I've already talked about that, and you know I'm I'm usually paying attention to what's going on in the world of gear to some degree, but I don't really go out and purchase a lot of new uh, you know to use a cliche sort of outside of my comfort zone or outside of the box type products. Uh, for my hunting, you know, I know what I use, I know what's effective in my area and I know what I like and, and I tend to, to stay in that lane. So for me to kind of look outside of that for this was, was fun to, you know, kind of consider that, but to be quite honest, you know, a lot of the products that I have in my list here to talk about, I probably won't buy, but I, I look at them and I say, you know, there's a market for that. Like there are hunters somewhere 
uh, that where that that particular product is is probably right up their alley, and they're probably super fired up that, that, that this is coming to market. So I hit on some of those items as well, some things that I'll use as well. But you know, I don't know what you thought about it. Yeah, I think it's it's cool. You know, we we do talk about innovation all the time, and like you said, these companies coming out with new products. I think it's cool. Some some people don't buy new things for um, you know years until there's breaks, and some people buy the latest and greatest every single year and they they trade their stuff in and upgrade or do whatever they feel like they want to do and there's no problem either way so you know i've had my i've had my layout blind for i don't even know how long probably nine ten years that Uh, thing's a nightmare it is a nightmare i mean there's so much (laughs) there's so much gorilla tape and nuts and bolts and screws and I'm just surprised I don't bleed every time I get in it, but you know, it, it still gets the job done. And like I said, I'm, I could get a new one, but at the moment it's still working, but you know, some people get a new blind every year. Some people get a new gun every year. It's, you know, in the archery, people get new bows every year. It's, I don't know, you know, it's whatever you feel like doing, but, uh, you know, it's cool. I think this is a, a good episode. We have a few new products here, so we can get into them and, you know, it might might push people to go buy them, or they might think it's not a very good idea. So, it's what we do. We talk about things. You want me? To yep. So I'll start. Okay. I'll start. I've got one that I know for sure that I will be buying, and I'm looking very much forward to this product coming to the market. And we've already talked about them a bunch on the show today, but I'm going to do it again because it's just the truth. The Higdon uh, foam-filled standard canvas back decoy is number one seed on my to-purchase list uh, going into this fall. Um, it's no secret that I've that I've found my calling in diver hunting. Uh, I love doing it, and I've also talked about how I do it out of a canoe. You know, so it's kind of a unique setup. But um, the canvas back decoys that I have currently are foam-filled from Higdon, but they're the battleship. Uh, decoys which if you have the ability to hunt over about a battleship rig more power to you and it's going to benefit you because they're much larger and they're much more visible my problem is i don't have the boat space to haul them out so for uh what i can fit six of the battleship uh, battleship canvas back decoys in that i have now i'll be able to fit a dozen perhaps almost a dozen and a half of the new standard ones so um, I've been slowly transitioning pretty much all of my spread to just the standard size and not the, the battleship ones. And I've been very happy with that and can make a nice little knot out there in the open water. And, uh, you know, we get pretty good pushes of cans at times. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to adding these to my spread. I think it will finally sort of uh, put a, a bookend on my, my spread for what I can actually accommodate in the canoe. So... That's another sort of relief where I can stop thinking about diver decoys and gear and, and what, what else I want to purchase because I just physically won't be able to hunt it any more than what I already have. So um, maybe someday if, if I get a nice boat or something like that, I'll be able to uh, build onto it. But till till then, um, dozen, maybe two dozen canvas back, fully uh, full uh, foam-filled uh, Higdon standard uh, canvas backs are my number one to uh, to purchase here for 2016. All right, so let's talk about the elephant in the room and, you know, the the ongoing bashing of my diver spread and I did say, you know, we had a Allegedly. we we had a photo contest going on which we ended up winning thanks to, you know, all the guys in the group and um I did uh send a half dozen foam-filled mallards out to Kansas, so um I kept my end of the bargain on that, and I said that I would let you choose the first dozen divers that I purchased. So, what am I buying? Well, I mean, I I think you probably should buy bluebills to to as your first dozen, because pretty much, for the most part, most anything will decoy to a bluebill. De- you know. Uh, with some reasonable success. So I think you'll be happy with, I think you'd be happy with some blue bills, but I think <laughs> based on the picture, based on the pictures you send me, I, I think you need to add some cans and you need probably some redheads in there. And, uh, you know, you'll be all set. How about buffalo heads? 
I mean, you know, the bubbleheads are interesting. They're they're uh, they're a duck that a lot of guys will claim like to only decoy to themselves, and that they're like racist bastards and stuff like that. Um, I have not. I well, I've I've had that experience, but I've also had them just completely ignore the bubbleheads and land in the middle of my canvas backs. Um, so I'm not sure that it matters that much. Does it help if you have them and then they see them? Yeah, it probably does. But does that, do I think that they're going to flare on your spread every time if you don't have buffalo heads out there? Probably not. So if you want to sprinkle some in, you, you should, I do, you know, cause we get a lot of buffalo heads around here, especially when there's no other ducks moving around, we'll get buffalo heads. So I always throw some out there. But, you know, we're not trying to build a six decoy spread here, Dan. We're looking to a <laughs> little more volume, a few, few more numbers. Uh. So uh, if you're looking for a good, solid foundation, you know, most diver hunters are going to tell you you can't go wrong with the blue. All righty. There it is. First dozen marked down. I'll make a call here shortly. All right. my uh, My first product is the Dark Energy Poseidon. And this is a portable charger. It is $99, which right now they are running a Father's Day special at 20% off. Um, All the reviews on this thing are awesome. Uh, Destruction tested. It has a... What is it? It is is a portable charger. All right. So... I thought it was like something out of a Harry Potter novel. No, or so what this thing Poseidon or whatever you <laughs> Dark, call it, it is called the Poseidon. Um, the the charger cord has some 550 paracord wrapped around it in case you ever need that. But um, it has a light, it has a cable. Um, this will charge your phone, GoPro. Um, you know, you're in reach if you have one from Delorme. Um, you know, pretty much anything it will charge. So, uh, I know on multiple hunts, if I hunt anything, you know, from early morning till past 10 AM, my phone seems to enjoy dying on me. So, you know, that's, I think it'll probably charge your phone like 16 times on one charge. Um, it has a flashlight on it and I actually have purchased this item already and it is pretty awesome. Um, it's probably the size of a, um, probably in a little bit bigger than iPhone 6 but not as big as a 6 plus so if you know the sizes of iPhones it's right in the middle of that um, but it is it's pretty cool so I know you know multiple hunts that my GoPro has died on me too and I don't know if that's a battery issue or I just don't charge it fully but you know to have that in my bag and um, waterproof dust proof all that good stuff so um, that is my first item and I have used it and I, I recommend it. So there you go. Yeah. Your phone is always dying on you. So you'll probably get a lot of good use. Yeah, out of that. I don't know what that's about. I'm trying to pick up Wi-Fi, and mm-hmm. I never turn it off or something. Yeah, that's probably true. All right. So number two for me is probably something that I will not use, but when I saw it, it caught my eye and, um, you know, it, it, it's a it's kind of a gutsy move I think by this company to to bring this product out and that's the uh the heavy teal you know the teal version of heavy heavy shot and uh they're offering this heavy teal specific um in number 5 and number 6 and 2 and 3 quarter and 3 inch shells 1500 feet per second pretty good price 15 to 17 dollars per box but you know I saw that and I was like man this is a company that's really sticking their neck out there on a uh you know for a, a, a a targeted species that, um, you know, like around here, I mean, we may see some teal in the early season and we may get a few shots, but I mean, it's not something where I'm buying specific ammo just for that opportunity. And I know that there are areas where they get pretty good teal pushes and all that kind of stuff. But I thought it was interesting to see a company sort of, you know, breaking it down to that level, um, you know, with this product offering, because obviously it's not cheap for them to do that. So they're taking a risk or they at least feel that there's a a good market share for this. So, um, I guess we'll see if that, if this effort bears any fruit, but you know, um, most people, uh, at least none that I know, um, really go above a four for ducks. You know, most guys are shooting somewhere between two and four from what, you know, at least my personal experience, there may be others that, you know, do this kind of thing that I'm not aware of, but you know, 
I think this is a little bit outside the box uh, thinking on their part, and uh, we'll see if it's if it works. And you know, um, it's not on my list, but Black Cloud has the uh, Snow Goose cartridge now too. So it's like um, kind of the same thing. I imagine that more people hunt snow geese, or more more shots are fired at snow geese. I would think, maybe, maybe not. Yeah, I mean that that makes sense because you're you're, you're selling a you know a product to a hunter that in the conservation season can put an extended magazine on his shotgun and put ten ten cartridges in in one round, right? You know, and he may shoot all or most of those in one volley, depending. Um, so, you know, I, I I mean, I guess I could see the the specific uh, marketing of it, and I mean, at the end of the day, you know. It's going to pull some people in, you know. There's going to be people that sees it, see it on the shelf, and said, "Hey, I'll give it a shot," you know, and you know it'll work to some degree. But you know, it's interesting, different technique. Yeah, we'll see if that is still around next year, or it might not be. Um, my next one is from Banded, and it is the Tenon Layout Blind. And what I really liked about this is just the low profile and there's a couple i think uh, foils has one as well but um this is just a, a new one this year so i thought i would talk about it um you know just a, there's so many going back to my gander mountain blind that i've had for way too many years you know you really do have to worry about shadows and you know making sure you have some bigger decoys around you just to to not throw the shadows or kind of blend in a little better so this thing, you know, it goes out a little further, and um, I imagine that there's some um, some pegs to hold the sides down. Uh, but you know, might be a little bit more brushing, but I think it's definitely worth it to to not have the shadows and and really get into a good hide. And that that's coming in. Yeah. that's two hundred and seventy nine dollars. Yeah, that the, I mean that's a that's the thing. You know, if you're a guy that's a you know a normal Joe and you're uh you know, in need of a new waterfowl blind, you go to Gander Mountain, you can get one for a hundred bucks, hundred fifty dollars. You know, or are you buying a two hundred seventy nine dollar banded one? I, I don't know. Um, you know, that's a lot of cash. Uh, maybe you know it could be worth it. You know, I don't, I don't know enough about it to to really say one way or the other. But you know, I think that's the thing that a lot of guys have to consider. And you know, it could be really popular with like guides and things like that, where they're using them day in and day out and sort of that, that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, like you mentioned, it is a concern if you're going to go the uh, less expensive route, you know, you gotta, you gotta account for the fact that you're going to be sticking up out there in the field and you gotta make arrangements to make sure you can still get a good hide and, and, and make it worth yeah, while. And so. the back of this, the back of this, the max height is 16 inches. So, um, the front height is 11 inches and, you know, it goes down from there so it blends right into the ground from from those heights so you know it looks cool i think it would it would definitely work if you're hunting some some fresh cuts or something like that but uh you know the price 280 you know like i said some people buy new every year some people don't uh new product yeah that's the thing if you're going to use it for 10 15 years or whatever <laughs> like you know you're using these gander mountain ones for i mean when you look at it, the cost over that time i mean you know, it's worth it. So it's all in how you look at it and how you approach it. But it is Bandit has always been a company that's kind of been a little more progressive in their blind designs, I think, and trying to get that low profile, low shadow approach. Uh is something that you you've seen from them a lot. Um let's see here, what do I got next? Um so my next one is is a product that I won't buy, but uh, is something that I found interesting, and it's the uh, new offering from uh, uh, Remington, the V3. I don't know if this is new for 2016 or if it's new just to me, but you know, I, I'm just now noticing these ads for this gun, so I kind of looked at it a little bit closer, and you know, it's going to be offered in a two and three quarter and three inch 12 gauge. So, um, you know, I think that as we've talked about on the show, uh, the pocket for a lot of uh, hunters is that three inch 12 gauge, you know, um, of course there's plenty of guys that shoot three and a half and, and that's all fine and good. But I think that, um, you know, this offering from Remington, uh, you know, for a long time, Remington was, you know, it didn't get much bigger. I mean, uh, you know, you, you, there's, there's, you know, who knows how many people 
are in the same position I am. They can say the first shotgun that they ever were bought for them by their dad was a Remington 870. You know, I mean, there's probably a lot of guys out there and probably a lot of guys out there. The first auto loader they ever shot was an 1100 or something like that. You know, Remington used to be, at least in my opinion, held up there as, you know, one of the pinnacles in the, the industry. And then, you know, for whatever reason, you know, it seemed like they had kind of fallen from that pedestal to some degree. And, uh, you know, they made a resurgence there with the Versa Max. And you've got some guys, uh, you know, guys that listen to this show that we know stand by that that gun and swear up and down by it. And then I've heard others that, uh, you know, say it's not even worth using as a boat or to paddle their boat back in. So, um <laughs> You know, it really has been kind of like Jekyll and Hyde with that gun, it seems like. You know, some guys love it, some guys hate it. Maybe that's the way it is for all the guns. But it seems like with the Versa Mask specific, specifically, uh, you know, there was a lot of that conversation with gone. So I guess where I'm going with this is I want Remington to be a leader in the industry. I think it's good for everybody. Um, you know, waterfowl hunters, rifle hunters, everybody. When Remington is, at, you know, producing good quality products – and pushing that envelope of uh, engineering, it just helps lift everyone. You know, it's, what do they say? You know, rising, rising, rising seas, burn, you know, raise all boats or whatever it is. Um, I think Remington's the type of company that is, is good for business for everybody. And uh, I'm really hopeful that this V3 will be a successful offering from them. And, uh, you know, hopefully something that they can, t- can, can build on and continue to uh, sort of reestablish themselves as a leader in that, in that role. And I do have to say that, just about any gun would be pretty bad as a oar for a boat. You know, it was a, it was a metaphor, a <laughs> metaphor there, Dan. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, next one is coming in from Sport Ear. It is the X Pro. This is a twenty one ninety nine dollar earplug. Um, you know, some guys they don't wear earplugs because they say they can't call with it or they can't, you know, they can't hear everything, whatever the case is. I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even say some guys, I'd say most guys. Don't. Yeah. And they, they really should. This one, um, you know, this isn't your $500 or, you know, $2,500 earplug that you can, you know, turn on and off. It's a 21, $21 99 cents. Um, it does have a push button that I think, uh, if it's opened up the, it's like 15 decibels and if it's closed it it cuts uh, 30 decibels so um you know you still could get some hearing damage from it but for the guys that still want to call or be able to talk in a blind and not spend a ton of money this is a uh, a very good product and i've used it uh, shooting in the backyard here i haven't used it in the field but i have called with it you can call with it and it really you know it it's almost the the best of both worlds and especially at twenty twenty two dollars, you can't go wrong to try it out. Yeah, I've used the product too, and quite frankly, I couldn't even tell the difference when the thing was open or closed. To be honest with you, uh, maybe I just you know I don't sit them in my ears quite far enough or whatever. But I mean, the reality of it is for me, whether I got something in my ears a little bit or a lot of it, like it, you know, calling with something in your ears is an adjustment. It, it's it's not the same, and it's something you have to get used to and something that you can, you can work through. But, um, you know, we've talked about hearing protection on the show before, uh, at least a little bit. And, you know, I don't want to like do a soapbox today on that, but all I'll say is, you know, when it's gone, it's gone. Um, so it's worth protecting. Um, and you know, even if it's a little bit, even if it's 30 decibels and I'm with you on the, I can't tell a difference, which it is only like 15 decibels. I can't tell a difference in when it's open and closed, but just that little bit, if it is 15 or 30 that it's cutting out from a a gun blast, it's going to help in the long run. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes I'll have ear protection in and I won't have it jammed all the way in, uh, you know, just so that I can talk or it's a little bit easier for me to call and, yeah, I'm not getting full protection, but I'm getting at least some. And like you know, just like I said, when it's gone, it's gone. So uh, for me, it's worth paying attention to. But um, I agree with you; it's a it's a more affordable product that they're they're trying to, you know, uh, be somewhere in between the high tech, costs a lot of money to 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 get, or the foam things that you pull off the you know production line at work kind of thing. So it's built for a little more comfort functionality that kind of thing so um, it's good to see that there's companies you know making that making that kind of push 
Yep, yep. Um, okay. All right. Well, let me go on to my next one here. Um, I know we've got a little bit of overlap in this particular area, so mine's much more general than yours, and it's the uh, it's the Sitka timber pattern. Um, obviously, big fans of Sitka on the show. No secret there. Um, honestly, probably won't buy any of the timber gear. I don't really hunt flooded timber that much, but um, I do think that it's interesting to see that they're, um, you know, branching out in this way. Um, you know, it's more of a niche market again. And, um, you know, I think for whatever reason, we're seeing that a little bit across some different platforms. You know, they talked about it, um, uh, in one of the discussions that we had with Higdon, it's like, you know, it, it, it takes a lot of money and a lot of resource to, to launch a product. And if that product is only going to appeal, appeal to a small niche, they have to evaluate can we make a return on our investment for this particular niche? Well, obviously Sitka feels that they can in this timber niche. So I'm really anxious to see, um, you know, what this leads to as far as innovative new products and, and, uh, you know, their first iteration of the, uh, elevated pattern lasted a few years and they discontinued it and relaunched into the elevated two pattern. So I'm interested to see what this does for the waterfowl, camouflage line with Sitka and uh, if that will if the the timber pattern will lead to a rework of the original pattern in the next couple years and uh, you know all of that kind of stuff so I'm interested to see where the company goes with this uh, pattern that would appear to be more of a niche you know for me than uh, you know than maybe some of the other stuff they've offered traditionally yeah I don't you know it's darker than what we need up here Um, but like you said, it's niche, and and a lot of the guys down south are excited about it to to get into timbers or sloughs down there. So, um, I'll I'll continue with Sitka, and um, they came out with the the layout pant and jacket, and we've talked about it before, and we are kind of against uh, going with any of the bibs, the Gore Tex bibs, because you're spending so much money, and then you're going to be walking through cut corn, and um, you know it you spend that much money and get a get a good gash in it and it's you know not what you are expecting so um what they came out with now uh really heavily reinforced pretty much from your thighs down uh to resist any kind of cutting from cut corn or anything like that it's Gore-Tex on the back it's insulated on the back so if you're laying against cold ground or anything like that um you're going to be nice and comfortable they have a couple, you know, call drops on the jacket so everything's right on your chest when you're laying down. Um, you know, it's it's pretty cool. It's innovative. Um, they're expensive, like everything with Sitka, but if it's something you do a lot, it might be something worth looking into. Another product they came out with is the Collar's Glove, and I think I'm probably going to buy it to try it out and... and you know, go with it. I usually don't wear gloves. Um, but this one, you know, you wear it on your non shooting hand and there's a muff on top of it. So whenever you call, you have your, your main hand out and you can call and shoot and everything like that. But when it's cold, you have a muff on the other hand's glove. So, um, really cool. $99 Gore-Tex. So if you're throwing decoys out and, it gets wet, no problem. Um, just cool. Something that um, innovative again, and and I'll have to test it and maybe write a review on it. Yeah, it's always interesting when you, uh, you know, you're looking at shopping in gloves and they're sold like individually. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's not sold as a pair. Yep. Um, so something you got to kind of think through before you. Yeah. So if you're interested in making that, purchase. if you shoot right-handed, then you want to left-handed collars glove if you shoot lefty then you want a right-handed collars glove just so i mean it is it's quite insulated and and the muff on top is you know it's big enough to stick your other arm in so you know you deal with a little bit uh the first reviews when it came out everyone was complaining and said you know you definitely need two hands to call with um you know you have that one hand up there as a guide hand if you're competition calling you definitely need I would say need both hands, but if you're calling geese, I think you could geese or ducks. I think you could get away with it, and they think the the same way because they put this product out and they think it'll be successful. So something new. 
Yeah. Guess time will tell. Um, all right. I got three more things to note. Uh, the next one I definitely won't be buying because it has to do with boats. And as we've talked about, I'm, um, I'm in the canoe game right now, but, um, you know, I, I don't really have a specific one of these products to talk about, but it seems to me that if you're a guy that's hunting in the Delta areas or something like that, where you need a mud motor, that it's never been a better time to be a, you know, a duck hunter, because, you know, when I get these magazines and stuff like that and I'm looking through them, you know, there's never a shortage of different mud motors and options and companies and horsepowers and all this kind of stuff. Um, so it really seems like that um, the motor industry has picked up, which, you know, is telling me that, that the the lifeline of these companies, which is the waterfowl hunter and the waterfowl community, is strong, you know, and, and you know, these products are coming up everywhere and they're pushing the envelope and there's obviously a, a strong amount of people buying these products. So, you know, it's, it's good for, for me to see that because like I mentioned, you know, for us and we're hunting big water, uh, a mud motor is not going to cut it. You know, we need something that's going to be down in the water all the time when we're in the chop and all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, I know that mud motor is even kind of like we've talked about, it's more of a niche thing for certain areas and the types of hunting you're doing. But, you know, it just seems to me like there's no shortage of choices and good choices out there. If you're, uh, if you're in the market for a mud motor. Yeah, I, <laughs> I hate looking at at them because I want them, but also, I mean, it seems like in the last couple of years the used boat section is just exploding. It seems like there's so many good deals on on decent sized boats with motors. So, yeah, keep buying them and keep selling them, and you know we might end up in some new boats or new new used boats. New to new to me, right? Boats. New to new to us. I gotta just get my I gotta just gotta get my HOA to allow me to store it in my driveway <laughs> and then I'm gonna them all in. But till till then it's not it's not looking good. Uh, no, the wife won't go for a diagonal parked duck boat in your garage. Yeah, we tried that once. Didn't didn't go over so good. <laughs> so that that one ended up on Craigslist. <laughs> uh, all right. Um my next one is dealing with coolers and I'm sure that everyone has seen a Yeti Hopper and Bison Coolers has came out with one too. Um, you know, I think it's pretty cool. It's easy to carry, uh, still holds a ton of ice and drinks. If, you know, if you are doing the teal hunts in Texas or whatever it may be, the September hunts up here get hot and you don't want to carry a giant cooler out in the field with you. Um, you know, they're, they're pretty neat to have. Uh, they are expensive. I mean, you're talking the smallest Yeti hopper, the 20 is coming in at 300 bucks, but you know, it depends how bad you want a cold drink or if you just want to throw one in your blind bag with you. Um, I won't be buying either one, the bison or the Yeti just cause it's too much money. I can't justify that, but you know, some people have already, I've seen them floating around Facebook and, and people really enjoy them. So if it floats your boat, that's something that, uh, or or your canoe, it's something you might want to look into. Hey, canoes or boats too? Hey, okay, man, don't don't disrespect. I'm running a boat. I'm running a canoe too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, the the Yeti thing is interesting because, you know, um, I honestly I can almost I I can almost justify a a a, a, a hopper type product more so than a regular cooler. Um, just because, you know, yeah, I can use my cooler, uh, for certain events and certain things, but I don't use it that much. Right. But a hopper, I mean, I could use that in hunts and stuff like that, but I mean, I could take that with me to the ball game. I could take that with me when I take my son to the playground, you know, or you're at a softball tournament or whatever it is. And it's just easier to carry, you know, it's right. not the big coolers that it takes two guys to carry and they're, you know, cumbersome and all that kind of stuff. This thing you sling over your shoulder and go. So, you know, if, if you're interested in one and you like one and you're trying to sell your old lady on it, you might be able to, you know, show her how much use you're going to get all out of the blind. And then, um, you know, whenever you want to use it for sporting events, you, you know, you got it locked up, but you got to also take it with you to the, uh, you know, the tailgates on Saturday mornings for college football and all that kind of good stuff. And they, but, they do. Know, I was looking I, at them today and they have a, a little pouch that you could add on for like 30 bucks that's waterproof and, you know, unbreakable that you could put, uh, 
your keys or phone or anything like that. And so if you do take this out and, you know, it starts raining, you don't have to worry about that. So you have a little, a little dry bag that's attached to your cooler. So I thought that was just as cool as the hopper itself. Yeah. And I mean, for, let's be honest. I mean, what's not expensive these days, you know, it seems like everything uh, is just expensive. It's hard to get. And stuff, it really, I mean, you, you, know. you, you pay for, you know, what you get. So I, you know, uh, going back to the sit good, we've talked about it before. If you want to be comfortable and in good gear, you're going to pay for it. And it, it is what it is. Right. For sure. All right, man. Two more things for me. And one is it's really not a product and it's really not a, uh, uh, anything new, but it, it just, it's sort of one of those hunch feelings that I have that I figured I'd share. And for me in 2016, I'm looking forward to what at least in my mind is sort of a resurgence of wood calls. You know, for a long time, for me, and again, this is just my minor optic, you know, one one guy, but for me, it felt like for a really long time, the, the call industry was so focused on acrylic. It was all about acrylic and, you know, the calls and the, the crack and all that good stuff that the acrylic offered. Everybody wanted to push that. And, you know, it seems to me that now, for whatever reason, I'm noticing more wood calls and more of a resurgence of wood calls in the market and more people valuing those mellow, less abrasive sounds and tones that a wood call affords you. And, um, you know, to, you know, it's literally music to my ears in that sense, because that's how I am. And I love, I love the sound of wood calls and I'd like to add another, uh, you know, uh, wood goose call to my lanyard. And, um, you know, if there's more options to choose from out there, I'm seeing some, you know, some of the bigger companies, you know, um, doing more custom engraving type work and some really intricate things, which I think is really cool. So, uh, I don't know, maybe I'm on an Island here, but it just feels to me like there's a little bit of a resurgence happening here and I'm, I'm all for it. You know, it makes me think that it's on my, I, you know, I work in a oil and gas industry is my main job and it's very cyclical. Like right now, you know, we're, we're slow because, you know, oil just broke back over $50 a barrel, but it almost seems like, you know, everyone used to use silos and then, you know, went to the full bodies. And now a lot of people are going back to silos and I feel like the calls are the same, you know, and it might be people are adjusting to the birds. Everyone hears that loud crack. All the birds hear the loud crack of the duck call or the goose call. And, you know, maybe the mellower sound, it, it's might be more natural to them. You know, if it's a quiet day and that's something that, that they like more and, and you can definitely utilize it. So, you know, be being different and getting away from the acrylic might be a way to, to fill your strap up. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I hunt primarily over water a lot of times. I mean, I do some field hunting, but usually when I'm field hunting, I'm hunting fields that are a little bit smaller, wood, wood lined, things like that. So if I cut loose on an acrylic call, it just echoes down through the woods and doesn't sound natural. You know, I'm not running traffic on these big fields where I'm trying to like call birds out, you know, from open areas and stuff. But, um, you know, to your point, Dan, a lot of the product piece of it comes from keeping up with the Joneses, you know, I mean, as a, as a waterfowl hunter who loves gear, I would love to have a, you know, a, a six by 12 enclosed trailer full of full bodies and layout blinds and all that kind of stuff to just, go out and get after it but um, at the end of the day I can't afford that I don't have the space for it so yeah I went on a run where I wanted to buy some full body decoys and I bought some and now I'm finding myself being more partial to the silhouettes just because they work and it's easy and it's cost effective and at the end of the day we're all you know it's about killing birds and why spend more than you have to why take up more room than you have to I mean this is just my opinion again um, to say that I wouldn't love an enclosed trailer with a bunch of decoys sitting in my driveway now is, is a lie. I would love that. I would love to have, you know, eight dozen full body decoys. Love it. But it's just not realistic for me. So, um, you know, I end up coming back to what is realistic and what's going to be effective. And at the end of the day, you know, if I'm only getting one or two days a week out in the field, I'm not going to be on freaking outdoor channel anytime soon, you know, busting dec you know, busting birds, you know, up in, uh, Alberta or wherever over these massive spreads and bean fields. 
you know, I'm down here on the Potomac River trying to call in some some pressured geese over a, a modest spread that I can fit in my canoe. So, you know, got to go with what works. And for me, that's what works. There you go. <clears throat> um, my last one is coming from Real Avid, and it is a gun cleaning mat. Um, you know, I've, I've, cl- this is, this is, there's so much irony going on right now in my mind. I can't or even you, take it. Hey, I, this, this past year, <laughs> I, I cleaned my gun more than I can count. It was, it was always getting opened up and cleaned. So you can't, you can't bash me too bad <laughs> anymore, but all right. So coming in at $19 and 99 cents, um, this mat is almost four foot by a foot and a half. Um, it is has an oil resistant work surface uh, and a tray to keep your parts in. So, you know, there's a lot of times that I want to clean my gun, and you know, I want to be upstairs in the in the kitchen on a kitchen table or something like that. Uh, and I usually throw a towel out. Um, if I get oil on it, then you know, the, the towel's pretty much done. So I have one that I usually use, but this one's you know oil resistant, has a parts tray to keep everything in. It's long enough for a long gun, for a shotgun to take everything apart, clean it up, roll it up, and put it away. So for 20 bucks, um, you know, it's padded. I think that it's, I think it's just a a cool product. I'm sure that it's not the first one out there, but it's a new one. And that might be one that I do purchase just so I can come up in the living room or the, or the kitchen and, and do my work. Yeah, and your wife won't get mad at you taking all the uh, bath towels and getting <laughs> gun oil spilled on. I do love that smell, but it's definitely not a after shower musk that that I'm looking for. Yeah, she's like, "Oh, what's that new cologne? Oh, it's Hoppies. Don't worry about it." <laughs> yeah. Um, no, that that's good. You know, I think everybody. Well, I can't say everybody, but there's a lot of guys out there that are guilty of not as efficiently cleaning their gun as they should. So. Uh, definitely something to consider if you're looking to, to step up your game there. But uh, for me, last one, uh, it comes from our friends over at uh, Big Al Silhouette Decoys. We've been talking a lot about silhouettes here this episode. Um, but he's kind of repackaged his product and is going a little bit uh, different than what you're seeing in the market today. And uh, he's now offering uh, the 14X, which is uh, 14 decoys for the price of 12. So he's no longer you know selling the, you know, you can get, you know, you don't have to say, oh, I'm going to buy a dozen here, a dozen there. You know, he's selling them at 14 for the same price that you'd get a dozen normally. So he's got more poses, six different positions, uh, 14 decoys, all for under 100 bucks. Um, you know, if you're interested in silhouettes, it's going to be a really difficult price to beat in the market. Uh, quality is good. The effectiveness is, is uh, unquestioned. Uh, you know, if you're willing to entertain a silhouette style decoy, uh, Big Al's is a fantastic place to start. Uh, Dan, you and I both uh, own Big Al's uh, silhouettes. We both really like them um, myself so much so that I'm really not interested in buying any more full bodies than what I already have. Uh, but I am interested in uh, adding to my silhouette decoy spread. So uh, for me, some good stuff coming out of uh, Big Al's shop there, and uh, he's a supporter of this show, so we appreciate him for doing that, and uh, we appreciate you know a little more bang for your buck over there with Big Al's. Two more decoys for the same price of twelve. Uh, can't really beat that. Are you going to go with some black and white old uh, Eastern Shore style? I love the black and white man. I do love those. Um, these new ones that he has with the new poses, though, I, I think only come in the printed you know uh, Canada Goose style, but. Uh, I would I would have absolutely no hesitations on hunting over the the black and white ones any day. I th- I just want to try them. I might get some just to try. But yeah, um, good guy over there, and you know, raising the bar a little bit. So, yep, can't beat nope. that. So those are those are our products here. You know, kind of some new, some old, some uh, you know, just sort of our thoughts and philosophy on them. But that's kind of what we're looking for moving into 2016. And uh, you know, when you're in the the off season here and kind of trying to fill your days thinking about waterfall hunting stuff a lot of times you know new products that you might want to have on your wish list come up and uh maybe we mentioned a few today that are on yours and uh maybe we uh, mentioned a few that will now be on yours after uh, hearing this episode so if you've got any other ones that you're eyeing up we'd love to hear it uh send us a message facebook twitter instagram uh send us an email info at hpoutdoors.com any of those will work and uh 
you know, like to hear what you guys have to say about it. But um, again, that's our look ahead for uh, gear and products for 2016. All right, man. Well, we're here uh, kind of at the end of the show, uh, a little bit longer than what I would have anticipated this show to run, but, uh, you know, never going to complain about that so much. But you got anything uh, you want to add here before we uh, finish off this, this um, one? It's Wednesday night. The Pens, I feel like they're going to close it out at home tomorrow. You know, they're they're up 3-1, and, uh, you know, they've had a good run. I, I feel like the new coach is really stepping up their game and actually I feel like the players respect them. So, um, I hope they bring it home. And right now the, the Cavs are beating the Warriors for the first time in their series, which I'm not really partial to any team. I like watching Steph Curry shoot the ball, but, uh, you know, good for them to actually give them a game over there for once. Yeah, I haven't watched one second of the NBA this season. I will not watch one second of it, but I've watched every second of the Penguins uh, when they're on TV down in my area, and uh, I will be all in on Thursday night, hoping that they clinch that out at home and uh, get that Stanley and uh, really um, put a nice end of the season for for us there, you know, as Penguins fans. And, um, you know, this episode will be coming out on Monday, June 13th which just happens to be my birthday. Oh, so, happy uh, birthday. L- thanks, man. A little, uh, little extra incentive for uh, for this one for me. So, um, you know, all good. And um, just another year down, you know. Where does the time go? But um, anyway, before we wrap this show up, I want to take just a second here and uh, thank the, the partners of this show that have helped uh, at least make in part the show possible. Sitka Gear, Sportier, Delorme, Big Al Silhouette Decoys and Higdon Outdoors. Uh, thank you to all of them for supporting the show. If you have an interest in any of the type of products that they offer, please consider them uh, when making your purchase decision, and uh, we certainly support them. Um, speaking of support, Dan, we've only mentioned this, I think, one other time on the show, but I know we've got a lot of new listeners, so I do um, want to uh, bring this topic up again, and that is the fact that um, if you listen to this podcast and you enjoy this podcast, um, you know, and the information that we bring to you, we are certainly uh, happy to have you on board and appreciate your support. Um, having said all of that, uh, this show obviously does cost us money to, um, you know, stand the website up and keep the web files up and all that kind of stuff that just make it happen, you know, for you guys on the other end to enjoy. So um, if you are so inclined to help, uh, support the show in any way uh, you can do that through the hp outdoors website on the podcast page there is a uh, a paypal area there where you can donate to the show um we certainly appreciate any uh you know anything that anyone uh should decide to donate through that and we are very very thankful and grateful to those who have already uh done so so thank you so much to them thank you to anyone who may uh uh, consider donating in the future. We don't like to sort of beat this topic down because we're honestly not looking for a, a handout so much as it's just, um, you know, a little makes it a little bit easier to keep kind of doing what we're doing, um, you know, when, when those, those costs are something we're helped with. So I don't really know what else to say about that, but I did want to just uh, let anyone who's new to the show who maybe has not uh, been to the website to check that out, that that is an option for you there. Um, anything else, Dan, before we go ahead and close up? Um, I don't know. Today, I think the high was maybe 60 degrees, and tonight it's getting into 42, I think, is the low. Had to get your weather. Dude, you had to get your I, little I, weather piece I, I did. <laughs> I feel like Brick Tamlin from Anchorman. But, <laughs> but, but uh, no, it really, like, I, I mowed a little bit after work today, and I was like, man, it feels like this weekend I should be out hunting geese. But... It's not the case, so mm-hmm. we we got some time, but uh, yeah, let's we'll be putting out some more episodes here. Got some good guests lined up, and I'm excited to get back in the in the swing of things here. Yep, absolutely. So, all right, let's put a button on this show and um, you know close it out in proper style. 
All right, we really like to thank you guys for tuning in to the 52nd episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our discussion about the products that we're looking forward uh, to checking out and trying out in 2016. If you've got some that you like, send them our way. We'd love to hear from you. As always, we'd like to hear from you through social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Check us out at hpoutdoors.com or shoot us an email at info at hpoutdoors.com. Check out all the past episodes on iTunes. Please subscribe so you get all the new stuff pushed out to you automatically. So for Dan, I'm Josh. Till next time, take care.